Hi guys. So I understand that um, going through Emerson might have been a little bit tricky. So my hope here is that this little video can help you make some sense of um, of everything that comes out in this. It's a pretty rich transcendental piece, so I can understand if you struggled a little bit with just one reading, which is why we'll take um, a couple of minutes to go through this so that your annotations kind of match up what you're going to need for class today. So you can see that I'm sharing my screen with you and my copy of um, From Nature, and I'm about to be interrupted by a dog, so bear with me if he jumps up here. But um, I want to go through this paragraph by paragraph with you because she said we were annotating for meaning, which means we've got a chunk of paragraph. So let's get right into it and start the first one together. So obviously this is an excerpt from an essay. It's called From Nature. Nature is the full collection by Emerson. And it starts with, to go into solitude, a man needs to retire as much from his chamber as from society. I am not solitary whilst I read and write, though nobody is with me. But if a man would be alone, let him look at the stars. The rays that come from those heavenly worlds will separate between him and what he touches. One might think the atmosphere was made transparent with this design to give man in the heavenly bodies a perpetual presence of the sublime. Seen in the streets of cities, how great they are. If the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe and adore? and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God, which had been shown. But every night come, the, come out these envoys of beauty and light the universe with their admonishing smile. So I'm going to make the assumption that the words that have the stars after them, you've already uh, uh, looked them up. So um, it's interesting, the beginning part, what we get from um emerson here so the comment i would make as far as annotating this text goes is i would highlight that because that's where you're going to write the comment or because you may end up commenting more than once instead of highlighting a whole piece i might actually try to um look at let me find the phrase here but if a man would to be alone, let him look at the stars. So right here, I would add the comment because again, we're looking at how Emerson chunks this piece for us. And I'm just going to scroll so you can see my comment. I would say something here like Emerson believes that people should go outside and look at the stars to truly be, what does he say? uh alone now i'm going to take that one step further in a second so uh let me make this so you can see the whole thing there you go so if we keep looking at this uh paragraph um let's go down to the the sentence that starts right here that says seen in the streets of cities so seen in the streets of cities how great they are if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years how would men believe and adore and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God, which had been shown. So basically what they're saying here is like, if you're in a city, you don't really see the stars. And the only way to appreciate them is to, to get out into nature. So I kind of like what he's saying here, and I would also annotate this, um, this sentence right here, because I think it contributes to the meaning of this paragraph. And I would look at it and say that Emerson, says the stars are rare and beautiful and can be seen when a person is away from a city. And if you give me one second, I'll fix that so you can see it. Okay. So that's the comment I made that went with that section. And I think that kind of gives us what we would need for paragraph one. So if you want to go ahead and pause, you're welcome to do that. Um, and you may want to uh, take a minute and get your notes down. If you have anything else you want to add to that, that's totally fine. But that would be the bare minimum of what I would add. Moving on to paragraph two. It says, the stars awaken a certain reverence because though always present, they are inaccessible. But all natural objects make a kindred impression, 
When the mind is open to their influence, nature never wears a mean appearance. Neither does the wisest man extort her secret and lose his curiosity by finding out all of her perfection. Nature never became a toy to, wise spirit, to a wise spirit. The flowers, the animals, the mountains reflected in the wisdom of his best hour as much as they had delighted the simplicity of his childhood. So this is kind of um, neat here. I kind of like where um, in this case, we see um, Emerson making the point that we have to, how, does he, how do I want to say this? Um, that people have to be open to accepting the beauty that is nature. So he says here, like in the first sentence, the stars awaken a certain reverence because though all always present, they're inaccessible. So like the stars are always here. We just don't always see them and we don't always know that we need to enjoy them. And he finishes it that in that paragraph where he says the flowers, the animals, the mountains reflected the wisdom of his best hour as much as they had delighted in the simplicity of his childhood. So basically here we have to be open to the idea of um, letting nature impress us and have our minds open to what nature can do. So my comment here would be, I'd select that whole first sentence and I would say that Emerson says that people need to be open to um, accepting what nature has to offer. And then I'd put in parentheses things like um, where he mentions uh, stars, that's a natural thing he mentions, um, flowers, animals, mountains, dot, 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 all of those things. I would include that. He's saying that man has to be open to those things. And I think he's exactly right. Um, I think he's also saying that nature can change and it creates, um, it creates a new curiosity. So I would almost add that one too. I think this is an interesting choice of words. So I would add a comment with that, that Emerson says that changes in nature can help us um, feel curious. You know, you want to question some things. So that's that for paragraph two. If you need to pause the video so that you can add those things, that's totally fine and go ahead and do that. I'm going to go on to paragraph three. When we speak of nature in this manner, we have a distinct but almost poetical sense of the mind. We mean the integrity of impression made by manifold natural objects. It is this which distinguishes the stick of timber of the woodcutter from the tree of a poet. The charming landscape, which I saw this morning, is indubitably made up of some 20 or 30 farms. Miller owns this field, lock that, and Manning the woodland beyond, but none of them owns the landscape. There is a proprietary, I'm sorry, a property in the horizon, which no man has, but he whose eyes can integrate all of the parts. That is the poet. This is the best part of these men's farms. Yet, to this, their warranty deeds give no title. So right there, he's suggesting these guys have these farms and this guy might have this property and this guy has this property, but nobody owns what's on the horizon when you're looking at the entire picture of the landscape together. He's saying no man has control over that. No man owns that. It's open to everyone. And he's saying in this case, it's open to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the poets. So I think that that stands out to me when he uses the word, uh, where does he say it? To the poet, poetical sense. I almost would take that word poetical sense here and say that Emerson, oops, I almost spelled his name wrong. Emerson um, sees nature poetically. He does not see individual land owned by farmers but he looks at the entire landscape, all of those places together to, um, how do I wanna say this? Um, to appreciate 
There we go. Nature. And that comment. I think that kind of summarizes what we're looking at in that paragraph. I like that he's saying that basically like, yeah, some guy might own this piece of the landscape, but the entire landscape is not owned by him. And that's what we should focus on and enjoy. Okay, next paragraph. Um, again, if you need to pause, I think you know the drill, go ahead and do it, but let's go on to uh, the paragraph that starts to speak truly, okay? To speak truly, few adult persons can see nature. Most persons do not see the sun. At least they have a very superficial seeing. The sun illuminates only the eye of man, but shines into the eye and the heart of a child. The lover of nature is he whose inward and outward senses are truly are still truly adjusted to each other, who has retained the spirit of infancy even into the era of manhood. His intercourse with heaven and earth becomes part of his daily food. In the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man in spite of real sorrows. Nature says he is my creature and mauger, I think is how you say that. Um, uh, all his impertinent, and then it actually goes on to the next page. So let me finish reading this part. Griefs. He shall be glad with me, not the sun or the summer alone, but every hour and season yields its tribute of delight. For every hour and change corresponds to and authorizes a different state of mind from breathless noon to the grimmest midnight. Nature is a setting that fits equally well a comic or a morning piece. In good health, the air is cordial of incredible virtue. Crossing, in a bear, crossing a bear common in snow puddles at twilight under a clouded sky without having in my thoughts any occurrence of special good fortune, I have enjoyed a perfect exhilaration. I am glad to the brink of fear. Into the woods, a man casts off his years as the snake his slough. And at what period, at, uh, at what period soever of his life is a child in the woods is perpetual youth. With these plantations of God and de uh, a decorum and sanctity reign and perennial festival is dressed and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years in the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing can befall me in my life, no disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes which nature cannot repair, standing on the bare ground, my head bathed in the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space. All mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. The name of the nearest friend sounds then foreign and accidental. To be brothers, to be acquaintances, master or servant is then a trifle and a disturbance. I am the lover of uncontained and immortal beauty. In the wilderness, I find something more dear and connate than in streets or villages. In the tranquil landscape, especially in the distance of the line of horizon, man beholds somewhat as beautiful as his own nature. Muggsy, Muggsy, stop. Please stop. I have a dog that's an obsessive licker. He's licking the floor. It's driving me nuts. Okay. So there's a lot of bit, lot that we've got to break down in this paragraph. And I want to take you back up to the beginning where it starts. Um, because I think that's where the first note is of something that should probably stand out to you. So um, the first thing we very much see is, let me find it. It should be in this part. There it is. So most persons do not see the sun except for a superficial seeing. So the idea of something being superficial means that it's on the surface, not deep, meaning their understanding of the sun is not deep. But then he takes this one step for, further and says, here, the sun Hi, second dog. The sun illuminates only the eye of the human, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, only the eye of man, but shines into the eye and the heart of a child. So with this part, I think we're really learning something significant about 
Emerson. Okay. And what he's saying here is that really truthfully children um, are open to nature and see it fully, not superficially. He's suggesting that adults actually see it um, superficially, whereas uh, children see nature, see the see um, how nature can be curious or exciting for them. They see those different sides of it. And he goes on further and he says, like, in the era of manhood, it's even hard for men to accept uh, what nature does for them. In fact, he says in the sentence where he says, in the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man in spite of real sorrows. So basically, um, that sentence right there, oh goodness, probably gonna have a dog fight right here. So, um, in the presence of nature, oh, see, sit down, sit. Thank you. Lie down. Lie down. Lie down. Oh, this is, this is not a good idea. Lie down. So here he says in this, uh, in the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man in spite of real sorrows. So this sentence right here, we are able to chunk this part and explain that um, nature can um, help. Oh, goodness. These dogs. Nature can help um, people see. Sorry help people see beauty even when um, they might be feeling, uh, what does he say? And we'll put it in quotes, real sorrows. Okay. So I would add that one there. So again, this, this beginning part of the paragraph is talking about how um, children really are very open to nature. It's kind of what they know and what they recognize and that it's really adults who have to remind themselves what they have to do as far as being willing to open and accept nature. Okay, next page. So the next part of the paragraph has an interesting um, sentence that stands out to me and it says, not the sun or the summer alone, but every hour and season yields its tribute of delight for every hour and change corresponds to and authorizes a different state of mind from breathless, from breathless noon to the grimmest midnight. So this is kind of a fascinating sentence. If we look at it, we say, let's highlight it first. So we know that the reason why we study these things is because the authors are often saying more than what comes to comes across in just the the words so not the sun or the summer alone but every hour and every season yields its tribute of delight for every hour and change corresponds to and authorizes a different state of mind from breathless noon to grimace midnight so the language there is very specific and i think that he's showing us if you can be open to nature you can see that kind of nature can um, mimic what happens in a person's life lifetime. So you, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but people have often talked about how um, there are seasons to a person's life. Okay. There is, um, there's actually a phrase and I, I'm not sure where it comes from. I'm sure Mrs. Savage could tell us. I only know because I know of some artwork that's connected to it, but they're called the four seasons of life. And so we know our seasons are winter, spring, summer, and fall. So those seasons also can equate a person's life span. And so we see, or in a day, the sun would indicate some life, whereas the grimace midnight might indicate the end of life. That's pretty deep right there. So I, I, if you didn't get that far with that meaning, that's okay. But I think right here, Emerson is making a comparison that we probably should pay attention to. So we have a comparison here between uh, the hours of the day, 
seasons and um, states of mind. Let's use his word, his words. So for example, you might think like, so right now for me, it is, I don't even know what time it is, 6.39 at night. I'm kind of tired. Okay. So this would, I'm not at my grimace midnight yet, but my state of mind is reflecting some, the state of mind of someone who would normally be tired. So he's using like nature as a comparison. Like, so not just what's happening in the natural world, but what happens to the human body naturally. Again, that's pretty deep. If it doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. You don't even have to annotate it. It's just, it's one of the things that stands out to me every time I read this. So we go on and um, the next sentence I think is the, is one of the cruxes of the whole meaning of this paragraph. It says, nature is a setting that fits equally well a comic or a morning piece. So what that's saying is that nature is accessible to everyone. So let me add this here. So everyone can access nature is what your note should be for that one. Okay. So nature is a setting that fits equally a comic or a morning piece. Basically, it doesn't matter whether you are a funny person or a generally sad person or what type of person you are, but nature can be accessible to you if you are open to it. The next sentence that I think helps us kind of chunk what this whole, this is a big paragraph. So there's a few different chunks that you want to make so that your understanding is pretty clear is down a little bit further. And it says, let me find it. I'm looking at multiple different copies here. Okay. Hang on. Here it is. This part. And I'm going to take this right down to here. So this sentence that I've highlighted right here that says, in the woods too, a man casts off his years as a snake, his slough, his skin. Remember snakes shed their skin uh, or whatever it's called. I don't know. Not a reptile expert. Um, and at what period uh, soever of life is always a child in the woods is perpetual youth. So what is he saying there? Well, I think we can see that he is talking about how you have to be open to nature, that kids are always open to nature. But then he's also saying that if you are open to nature, it kind of brings back the excitement that you might get as a child. Okay. So. For this one, you could say that Emerson says that, because um, he said this earlier, that kids are open to uh, nature and that when a, does he use the word man? Yeah, he does. Uh, that when a man goes into the woods, sorry, he um, how do we want to say that he can, uh, feel kind of like the same excitement a child might feel in nature. Okay. If I were to really summarize what that paragraph means for meaning, that is what I would look at right there. I think that's a pretty clear, um, statement that he makes. And then he says, so not only are you um, open to nature and you're feeling that same excitement, but he also says down here that it can help you return to faith. Where the heck is that? We return to reason and faith. You might want to bold that. You're totally, this is your document, so you can mark it right up. But we return to reason and faith. Basically, you get into the woods and you're feeling clarity of thought because you've been accepting of your new environment and you don't have these external influences on you. So you're able to kind of have this fresh appreciation and your mind can function using reason and faith. Reason meaning like knowing what you know to be true and faith and trusting that whatever is going to happen is going to be okay. Those are things that like kids really 
kind of practice every day because they don't know any different yet. There's like an innocence to that. They're going to use their minds to problem solve and, and rely on what they know. And then they're going to have faith that what they don't know is going to work out. And that's kind of what he's comparing here. So we did say uh, in our notes that transcendentalism is not really something that is uh, really super religious. In fact, she made note to tell you that it references this universal being, which this paragraph does. I don't know if you want to bold that, but you may want to do it right here. This is something that came up in our notes that she said, that's how the transcendentalists kind of refer to the idea of a power above. They're not necessarily talking about a specific God or religion, but just the idea that there is this universal being that kind of helps guide them. Um, the other fascinating statement he says in this is, I am nothing, I see all. So you might want to bold that. I think the idea, um, egotism vanishes. That means you're losing ego. So you're not there to serve yourself, but to appreciate nature and be able to see it in its entirety and, and enjoy it. So that was a big paragraph. That's enough about that. I think we've kind of hit that with everything. Um, I'll just, I just want to double check my notes. Okay. I do want to add one more thing. So this idea of reason and faith, where is that? Reason and faith. Let's add a note with that idea here. So before we have been talking about how kids are open to the idea of nature and that they are able to look at it and soak it in in its entirety and kind of enjoy it for what it is and have faith that it's going to work out. I think when he's talking about reason and faith, I want to add on in there that he's got to, um, when, when he's in nature. So I'm using the, the pronoun he because he's been only talking about men, but obviously this lesson would be applicable to anybody. But Emerson says that when a person, we can imply that, uh, goes into nature, um, he can kind of uh, see that his role is to look at the world with his own um, thinking and trust that um, trust that uh, trust himself maybe we should say that and trust himself like kind of have faith in himself, um, have faith in himself. He can appreciate what he sees because he is only, um, thinking, using his own thinking and trusting himself. So you can see that. I'll give you a minute to write that before we go on to the next one. I have some caffeine. Okay. All right. So the next paragraph, again, if you have to pause, you go ahead and pause. That's totally fine. Uh, the greatest delight uh, which the fields and woods minister is the suggestion of an occult relation between man and the vegetable. I am not alone unacknowledged. They nod to me and I to them. The waving of the bows in the storm, bows in the storm in this case, uh, is new to me and old. It takes me by surprise and yet is not unknown. Its effect is like that of a higher thought or a better emotion coming over me when I deemed I was thinking justly or doing right. So that's a nice short paragraph and we'll take those nice short paragraphs. Um, if I were to chunk this, I would say that um, he here is just recognizing the connection uh, that man can have to nature. So let's um, use this particular sentence to highlight. I think that's a great example. 
me scroll so you can see what I'm writing here. So I, uh, I am not alone and unacknowledged. They nod to me and I to them. He's referring to when he says that he's talking about like the growth in the forest. He's like, I nod to them and they nod me back, which might sound crazy to people today. But the truth is all he's saying in this paragraph is that man can relate to and connect to nature and nature connects back to him. That's it. Nothing more. Okay. Next paragraph. Yet it is certain that the power to produce this delight does not reside in nature, but in man or in a harmony of both. It is necessary to use these pleasures with great temperance, for nature is not always tricked in holiday attire, but the same scene which yesterday breathed perfume and glittered as uh, for the frolic of the nymphs is overspread with melancholy today. Nature always wears the colors of the spirit. To a man laboring under calamity, the heat of his own fire hath sadness in it. Then there is a kind of contempt of the landscape felt by him who has just lost by death a dear friend. The sky is less grand as it shuts down over less worth in population. So let's take a look at um, let's take a look at this paragraph and see if there's a way we can kind of summarize um, what he's saying here. So we've, he's been talking about like looking at nature through, through the eyes of a child, not like literal eyes of a child, but like trying to be open that way. Would you like to say hi? Oh, she said hi too. <laughs> so he's not talking about, um, literal children's eyes he's looking at looking at it through the innocence of a child's eyes where they are still excited about nature so in this paragraph um one of the things that should stand out to you is the sentence that says nature always wears the colors of the spirit and then that final sentence that says the sky is less grand as it shuts down over uh less worth in the population so basically he's saying here that it's important to look at nature as a whole. Remember he talked about that landscape earlier, not focusing on one tiny piece of it, but the entirety of it. But he's also saying here that man's perspective is important because if you look at what happened here to man laboring under calamity, I'm going to highlight that word because I think that that's a good word for us to discuss. Calamity means like, something bad is going on. So for a man who is in the middle of something bad going on, it goes on, it says the heat of his own fire hath sadness in it. Then there is a kind of contempt of the landscape felt by him who has just lost by death or a dear friend. So basically a person who is in a calamity who may have just lost a friend, um, they might be having a different experience in nature in that moment. It could shape their view of nature just simply based on their perspective and what they've been experiencing up until that moment that they're trying to accept nature. I know that sounds super deep. And here's this dog again. Oh, you are such an attention seeking dog. Okay. So let's make for our note for this one. Can you sit down, please? Sit, sit. Sit, lie down, lie down, lie down. Oh gosh, guys, this is so hard to type like this. Okay, so what is happening here is he is saying that um, perspective, that's where I left off, that a person's perspective can impact um, how we see nature. So let's add that. So a person's perspective or let's say mood can impact how they see nature. Okay. That's one of the first things we're seeing. It can impact their perception of it and nature can change just as, um, just as we change, I think. Hang on, trying to read and deal with a dog who's being ridiculous. I'm going to knock my laptop. Okay, so um, 
Yes, nature can change as our moods change. So let's see what we have. A person's perspective or mood can impact how they see nature, just like a person's experiences can change his or her bear to make it easier. Their mood, nature can change um, too also too. So I would do that. I think that that is a really decent summary of what that paragraph there is telling us. Is that it? Is that the end of our piece? I never know which uh, excerpt I have. This is what happens when you spend 20 something years working with the same person. Okay. Yeah. So I think that gets you through like the bulk, I'm sorry if you were still writing that down, the bulk of um, the essay and how you were basically taking notes for understanding. We are not tearing apart literary techniques. We are really looking at the surface of transcendentalism. And um, I hope that this helps you a little bit. Um, so good luck. I think today in your class, you'll probably work together on like the questions that she had posted with us, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, so you've got some great notes to help you get started. And if I were to summarize anything else about transcendentalism, I guess I just want you to think about it's kind of man doing something in solitude to reflect on himself and the greater world. Um, and that was very much not what the um, religious practices were that were closely tied to like how governments ran in the time. So society instead would have been much more focused on the idea that you don't use your own reasoning and trusting your intuition. Instead, you are going to follow what the Bible is telling you. Um, transcendentalism is kind of rebellious. It really wasn't that it's saying, yeah, there might be this like universal being, but truthfully, a lot of it has to do with how man is connected to himself. And in this case, nature. Um, and again, that really kind of the strict interpretations of religion that were used to, uh, set up societies during this time, during the transcendental era, uh, definitely would not have agreed with his thought process. But I think what you're going to find is most authors that we study in school tend to be people who made an impact because they diverted from what they were supposed to do or what was expected of them. Um, if you have questions, I will be in school today uh, at 11 o'clock. Um, and you can always shoot me an email or ask me questions then. I do hope this helped you a little bit. Uh, if you went through and read a couple more times and there were vocab words you were not sure what they were and they weren't already identified by the text, double click on them and look them up. You know, add those notes to your text, change colors of things. This is your document to keep. So I think that that will help you. One of the first things you might want to do that I did not do is number all the paragraphs. That might help you a little bit. Okay, so hopefully on Friday, we can go over any important annotations you may have missed uh, by not having me in class today for the Scarlet Letter. And um, what else? Anything, any questions you had for history on um, this era right before as we're encroaching on the American Revolution. So I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And again, I'll be in school around 11 o'clock. Um, so swing by, shoot me an email if there's anything I can do. And I appreciate you guys for giving this your best efforts. Thank you.